races on, and Max Verstappen held off a charging Carlos Sainz to win the Canadian Grand Prix. But in a race that was shaped by safety cars, both virtual and real, was this always destined to be a Red Bull win? And could the car ride row yet impact the title fight? I'm Ed Straw, and joining us to answer those questions and many more are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Well, Mark, how was it to be back in Canada after two years away? I, yeah, it was great. I, I thought you'd be able to tell me I was looking for you. I didn't see you. What, what, what happened? Yeah, I'm very, very easy to miss. Unfortunately, COVID finally caught up with me, so I was unable to uh, to board my flight. So I've been stuck at uh, stuck at base. But a shame because Montreal's always a uh, always a great race, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you sound remarkably healthy. Someone with COVID, but um, I guess um, you've got the nice the nice version or the less bad version. Um, yeah, uh, Montreal. It's always it, it's a really um, it's it's always been a really buzzing place at Grand Prix time, but um, it was magnified this year. It was just crazier than ever, and uh, yeah, it still had that lovely Montreal vibe, and still had the um, crazy Montreal changeable weather, so full on sunshine or absolute thunderstorm. Yeah, a bit of everything when it comes to the weather there. It's been like that, hasn't it? Since races have got crowds back. So many of these events have been just massive and huge crowds, mm. etc. I don't know whether it's just F1's become more popular or mm. just everybody's eager to go to things since uh, since uh, the lockdown's ended. Maybe the bigger crowds are changing the weather. Have you thought of that? Well, everything's connected, isn't it? What's your theory on that, Scott Mitchell? Uh, yeah, maybe the uh, may- maybe it is all to do with just the sheer uh, mass of, of supporters that we have uh, coming to to coming to events now. I, I think it's just. Uh, what was this? I, I don't know how many events now we've had where this year where the weekend attendance is over three hundred thousand, but I think that was the figure for this weekend, wasn't it? So um, obviously the the Canadian fans have waited a long time uh, for for their Grand Prix to be back. Um, I felt really bad because uh, did you see that uh, the teams had to basically cancel? Was it the autograph signing? I think it was on Saturday uh, because of the because of the heavy rain. So. Um, some of these fans, okay, they got to see a Grand Prix, which was the big thing. But um, some some of them have waited three years to be able to meet the drivers and get autographs again, um, and it got it got rained off. <laughs> Devastating blow for anybody queuing up for Nicholas Satifi's autograph. But yeah, it's, it's always a shame when those sorts of things lose out. But yeah, three hundred thirty eight thousand apparently was the weekend attendance according to F one. So yeah, another great event, and I'm sure we're going to have a massive crowd at Silverstone in a couple of weeks as well. Uh, let's get down to it, Mark. Just like Azerbaijan, this was a race that was shaped by safety cars of various forms, wasn't it? It came down to Verstappen versus Sainz, given Leclerc and Perez were out of the picture. So how did this one play out? Yeah, I think it it would have pl- it would have still been Verstappen versus Sainz no matter what. Um, you know, with with as you say, Perez and Leclerc out of the picture, the, the, they were always head and shoulders above the best of the rest, and in terms of the combination of pace and track position. So, um, yeah, the way it played out was that uh, Max um, looking quite comfortable at the front from Sainz beginning to pick up some front graining and that was um the, the other thing this has always been an easy one stop race and this time it wasn't and main, maybe because of the uh the heavy rain keep wiping the track clean um but there's, there's a few theories about that um but anyway it, it, it there was a concern that it might not be a one stop race that, that, that um most of the teams had going in and sure enough, Max start picking up a lot of front graining quite early on. Um, so obviously that was pushing them more certainly towards a two-stop anyway. But then we got the first VSC. So that was obviously what, you know, Red Bull were going to respond to that by pitting Max because he was already in a little bit of trouble with front graining. So he did that. And Ferrari, which wasn't really troubled by front graining at the time, obviously did the opposite. And so they were thinking, right, we, 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 we might be able to make this a one-stop if we can extend this medium tyre first stint long enough to get onto the hard to um, try and hold off them on a, on a two-stop. So that's how, it, after the first VSC, it was all poised. Um, and, the, yeah, the, the, the second VSC came at the perfect time for Sainz to get in with, for a cheap pit stop which neutralised Verstappen's 
cheap pit stop for the the uh, at the first stops. So that was all nicely evened out, and we looked like we were going to have that um, max yeah, two stop at max versus one stop at science. But then we got the safety car, and that reset everything all over again. Um, and that, that put science on new tires, um, on sitting on right on Max's tail uh, with a seven lap newer set of tires. And so, yeah, it was um, it was all then just poised for a you know a, a, a pressure drive from Verstappen and then an attacking few laps from Sainz. Uh, but it, actually, Max always looked like he had it fully under control. And I think um, you know, had the positions been reversed, he would have been able to pass the Ferrari. It was just, just a stronger all round package, I think. Maybe if Leclerc had been there, and maybe if he'd been able to stick it on pole. But these are all what ifs. And the reason he wasn't there, of course, was because he was starting from the back. And the reason for that was because the Ferrari liability is not good enough. So, yeah, we got. Um, I think what we got was a fair reflection of merit. Yeah, Sainz certainly said he gave everything and he was desperately trying to get there to get that first Grand Prix win, but couldn't quite do it in that 16 lap sprint to the end. But what you were talking about there, Mark, connects to our first question. Of course, we always have questions from members of the Race Members Club in our Race Review podcast. Head to the race.com and don't forget the hyphen and click on Join the Race to find out more. Not only do members get to ask us podcast questions, but there's all sorts of other little bonus content available. The question's from Louis Strohmeyer, who says, to a certain extent, the battle between Sainz and Verstappen seemed like a chess match where we couldn't really see the moves, especially regarding battery deployment. How close was the battle, really? Um, yeah, it was probably less close than it looked. And all that the um, the DRS was doing was allowing Carlos to hang on, really, and sort of make it look like he was still in contention. But it, he, he was always entering that back straight from too far behind and all the DRS was doing was getting them back up to, to, to close to the back of the, the Red Bull rather than being in a position to pass it. And um, and then it, it didn't have enough extra speed in the second DRS zone down to turn one to be able to do anything into that quite quick kink, which forms the first part of one, which they then have to break four into two. So it would have been an extremely ambitious move to to try it there, given the, the small speed difference between the two cars. So... Um, yeah, in terms of battery deployment, I think really um, there, there wasn't much of a game of cat and mouse to play there. I think um, Max always was always using just as as much as he needed, um, and Science was having to use it like full attack and then a lap off and then full attack and a lap off. And Max had enough inherent pace that he was able to just use little bits, and it was always enough to keep him ahead. Let's talk a little bit more about Carlos Sainz, Scott. Michael Griggs asks, do you think the Ferrari strategy to change tyres under the safety car cost Carlos the win? Do you think he could have held on if he kept track position? Um, I think uh, I think the fact that they had the opportunity to, 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 to make the stop under the safety car made it a bit of a no-brainer. I think one of the things that Ferrari talked about afterwards was that, um, first of all, they... Ferrari wasn't happy that it t- took a while for the safety car to actually be deployed, which I then I think then that 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 cost signs uh, a lap in coming into the pits, didn't it? Because after he was coming up towards pit entry, um, when when it was finally caught uh, deployed, so if that had happened a bit quicker, they'd have been able to react and bring him in, and it would have been a bit smoother. Um, but primarily, I think. Signs talked about this after the race and said that the safety car stayed out a bit longer than they expected. And actually, if they then if they'd anticipated the number of laps that were left at the end of the Grand Prix once the safety car came in, they might they that it would actually probably have been feasible for, for to go for a different compound um, and then try to 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 get Verstappen early in those laps uh, afterwards. But obviously. It's all a bunch of uh, ifs and buts. Ferrari are quite happy with how they played the race um, in the circumstances that were in front of them. I, I think it was, it's easy to say in hindsight they could have done stuff better, but it, it felt on the surface anyway like this was a slightly sharper Ferrari strategy than we've seen in, in recent races in Monaco in particular. We've also got another question on Sainz, Mark. This one from Michael Amherts, who asks, what do you think it will take for Sainz to get on top of his issues with the Ferrari? I think he's making progress. And it, although it's difficult to benchmark him this weekend, of course, because Leclerc's situation, um, he was pretty strong this weekend. Um, 
And I think, you know, that uh, the signs are there that he is making progress. And, uh, you know, he's averaged so far, if you take this race out of the equation and the Imola dry race, sort of two and a half tenths, which is a big chunk. Um, it's a similar chunk to, slightly smaller chunk than Ricciardo is off Norris. But obviously it doesn't look so bad when you're in a, a front running car. Um, but... I, I'd, I'd be surprised if he continued to be two and a half tenths off for the rest of the season. I, I don't see him getting back on level terms, but I, I, I do see him reducing that gap because he does seem to be making progress. Yeah, he did say after the race that he's kind of getting there. So it's chipping away. It's a it's a long haul. That, that occasional rear instability isn't good for him, but... He, he's coming on, but certainly it'll be frustrating him that he hasn't managed to get that first win of the season as yet. That's the big thing on his checklist, given that probably he's out of championship contention realistically, given the, the points deficits. Now, let's talk a little bit more about Charles Leclerc, Mark. You briefly mentioned him. He started 19th thanks to those power unit change penalties. It was a bit of a slow burner of a race for him, wasn't it? So do you think fifth was good damage limitation or could it have been a little bit better? Maybe it'd been a little bit better, but it was, it was he, he was doubly unfortunate. He got stuck in a safety in a uh, um, DRS train um, very early in his supposed charge. Was brought up very short for a long period of laps, and that delayed him being able to pull up enough of a a gap. So he wasn't really able to do anything when the the opportunities. For others, arose with the VSCs. He, he wasn't far enough clear of the traffic, and then of course they um, they, they then had a slow pit stop. They had a problem with um, on one of the corners with the with five point three second stop, I think it was. So that dropped them bang into the traffic that they'd just been trying to avoid. Um, and yeah, when he eventually got clear, he was reasonably quick, but not staggeringly so. He was on a very low downforce um, setup in order to ironically, in order to be able to overtake, which he wasn't able to do because his traction out of the hairpin just wasn't good enough to get a, a, a good run. All the um, all the low wing was doing was getting him back to where he'd been be- before he had the iffy traction. So, uh, yeah, it was a... The, the way it played out was uh, just unfortunate. So, given everything that actually happened to him, yes, fifth was okay, but with a more straightforward run, even from 19th on performance, he probably should have made the podium. Yeah, still 49 points behind Max Verstappen now in the championship. That's that's getting dangerously large, that gap. He isn't even second still in the championship, even with Perez retiring. And in fact, on the subject, Scott, of Sergio Perez, his decent run of success came to a juddering halt, didn't it? What did you make of his weekend? Oh, it was like watching... Uh... Perez for much of the first half of last season wasn't it um just especially uh, especially in the sense that he it felt like he was he felt like he was a bit off for Stappen um for the first time in a few races um and then obviously the the rain hit Saturday um was never likely to uh to play in Perez's favor um which you you sort of summed up quite uh, quite nicely, Ed, when we were discussing it on Saturday, which is that people just need to remember that Perez just isn't very good in the wet. So he was, uh, I think, he was always going to struggle, and he and he was really struggling in 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 Q one. He was fair. I wasn't lucky to get through to Q two, but it was it was not comfortable. Um. And then it wasn't really a surprise to see him make a mistake and go off in in in, in Q two, and then obviously he didn't get a chance to to really start recovering through the field because of his uh, because of his problems. So it was a uh, obviously comfortably his worst weekend uh, of the season. Uh, he didn't deliver um, when he needed to in tricky conditions, but you know that that's. That is what you need to do when you're driving for a top team. You need to be great in uh, in any condition, really. And Verstappen showed the golfing class between the two of them, ultimately, with, with a superb job. Perez couldn't live with him. And obviously, he can't be blamed for what happened in in the race. But it was, um, yeah, it's just a weekend to forget after what has been such a, such a good run of form. Yeah, real shame for him. Yeah, I do think, I mean, he's not a terrible driver in the wet, but it's not his strongest suit. I I think people tend to kind of think he is very strong in the wet 
going all the way back to that 2012 Malaysian Grand Prix, the wet dry race, he almost won for Sauber, but they aren't really uh, his conditions. And that's allowed Verstappen kind of to reassert himself. I think as we expected him to do, he is the main title shot for that team. But this weekend won't have helped Perez's uh, momentum, certainly. Well, Mark, let's move on to Mercedes. They picked up third and fourth with Lewis Hamilton finishing ahead of George Russell. But Hamilton seemed to go through just about every emotion this weekend. Yeah, absolutely despondent, wasn't he? And uh, on Friday, saying uh, just just awful, virtually undrivable, and, and just this is the car we've got for the season. So, yeah, and just resigned to it and looking forward to next year. Um, yeah, and then absolutely out of this world, delighted after the race and pretty pleased after qualifying. Yeah, it was an interesting comparison between the two Mercedes drivers, wasn't it? They had that split configurations on Friday with Hamilton running that experiment that didn't really work with a big cutout in the floor. And then Russell took that big gamble in in qualifying, the only driver to take slicks. What do you make of that, Scott? Do you think that was a little bit too much of a risk from Russell or or do you do you praise his swashbuckling attempt to try and nick an unlikely pole? Uh, I don't think it's a case of uh, either or. I think it's both. I kind of, uh, <laughs> I, uh, it never looked quite dry enough um to, to to go for it but but I still admire I still admire the effort I think uh Russell was uh, encouraged by his heroics last year and the way it played out at the Russian Grand Prix and that rain hit qualifying there on a drying track and he he thought that he thought there was an opportunity to snatch pole or a front row start or something so he thought he'd um he 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 thought he'd go for it. So I I don't have um I don't have any any issue with with, with what he did. Um I thought it was quite funny that over the course of um the qualifying session uh Gary Anderson was getting quite excited wasn't he about the uh, the possibility of the track drying and saying that lap time wise it had got to the point of switching to slicks and then Gary's sort of position softened slightly and it became uh, once you get past the very wet first couple of corners, it's probably okay for slicks. And then by the end of it, it was just like, this is probably looking a little bit too wet for slicks. <laughs> so even Gary, who absolutely loves a punt in conditions like that, managed to talk himself out of it. So yeah, Russell was just a bit wide of the mark on that one. Yeah, it's always the problem that you're governed by the worst bit and that turn one, two bit. Even if you get through it, you can lose so much time going through it. I mean, it's really, really slippery when you're in slicks in the wet. That, that, right hand part turn two just goes on forever and then you get a terrible exit because you haven't got the grip so you'll be giving away a lot of time even if you do negotiate it but I kind of see why uh, why he went for it it was it was worth a go but their actual their actual races Mark were fairly straightforward weren't they Russell made some good progress early on to make sure he kind of got himself up there and, and Hamilton it's just a question of getting his way through uh, through Alonso really wasn't it yeah and I mean they found a decent setup after you know, trying all sorts of different um, combinations, mainly on Hamilton's car on Friday and into Saturday morning, and they they they, they, they found that the that they are sort of boxed into a corner in terms of setup, and there aren't any ways that can go that can radically make the car better. So they just sort of went with what they had, raised it a little bit, softened it off a little bit, and it was okay. Um, it's still it was ultimately. About seven, eight tenths off the off the front, which is you know about normal, but in the race because the tire deg was high and because they weren't having to push each other, whereas Verstappen and Sainz were, Verstappen and Sainz were getting much heavier tire deg, so it was enabling the Mercs to catch back up again and towards the end of the stint. And, and when you when you looked at the did a comparison of the lap times towards the end of the stints, you know they looked they looked pretty good, but it, it was a bit of a false picture. They're not. They're not really within a couple of tenths of those two cars. They're as far off on ultimate performance as, as they've ever been. But the way that the race played out and the specifics of this track on this day give them a good race, and they made good use of it. And um, they're on slightly different specs. Uh, Russell had um, a bit, uh, quite a lot more downforce on the car um, in terms of w- uh, rear wing setting. And the thinking there was he was going to go all out for grid position in the wet qualifying. Um, in the knowledge that it probably was going to be a bit rubbish in the race as Lewis went the other way. Um, with a low downforce wing, um, but it, that, they actually both worked okay. Um, Russell's uh, p- expected penalty in, in the dry didn't really materialise because we had a really strong tailwind down that back straight and into turn one. So that that wasn't as punishing. The high wing wasn't as punishing as it might have been, but he was still getting the 
the good stability under breaking and stuff going into the hip. And so, yeah, it was, it was um, between them, they did, they, did, they did a really good job. And I think um, they, they, they played the VSCs well. Um, they couldn't bring George in at that first one because they would have had to stack them and also he would have that would have dropped him into um, traffic that, they, that he hadn't cleared. But it was a straightforward choice for Lewis. And then they got the opportunity for George with the second one. And then it was a little bit touch and go. Would Lewis, Lewis was always going to be doing a two stop from that first VSC, but would George maybe hang on, do the one stop? And it was looking for a time like they might do that. And then he realized, no, no, the, the tires are falling away. Let, let's, let's switch before it's too late. Um, and that was it, really. But um, yeah, uh, it, I mean, way, a way better performance than Dumbaku, but re- ult- and ultimately nothing to get too excited by. Um, maybe Silverstone will look more like Barcelona, which was um, actually their best, their most meritorious performance of the season to date, even though this looked good. We're going to have to talk about technical directives now, I'm afraid, Scott. The FIA issued that technical directive before the start of the weekend saying that plank wear and impacts would be monitored and that a metric would be created to limit the vertical oscillations drivers are subjected to after the concerns were raised about driver health. Sounds very simple, doesn't it? But could you sum it up in a, as digestible a way as possible, the controversy that followed and just outline what actually happened? I will do my level best. Uh, yeah, so on the eve of the uh, of the weekend, the FIA in- introduced this uh, or co- communicated to teams this technical directive, which is, could basically be summed up in, in, in two parts. One is sort of a sh- short-term effort to try and uh, mitigate the effects of the porpoising and, uh, and the bouncing, uh, permission to run a, a second floor stay while also working on a, on a metric to measure vertical oscillations and then set a limit to what the drivers can be subjected to while at the same time looking at uh, longer term changes to the technical regulations to reduce the potential for this sort of thing to happen, whether it's an aerodynamic phenomenon or a fundamental mechanical problem uh, pretty much everyone's in agreement that this is broadly a, a good idea especially as it's in the interest of driver safety and well-being but there's a whole mess of controversy around how it's been implemented the process the FIA has gone through what might have motivated certain elements of it and what happened over the course of the weekend and ultimately to quote Matia Bonotto it ended up being a lot of noise about nothing because the the main part of the TD or the interesting part which was this new metric to define a bouncing limit has actually been pushed back to the British Grand Prix Um, because unsurprisingly the FIA has proven to be a bit too optimistic with something this complicated and it it couldn't be done just off the back of a couple of practice sessions in Montreal. So there's so much more to come from this that the the sort of broad brush strokes of why it's controversial or what made it controversial is uh, such short notice to run a second seat, uh, second floor stay, for example, um, gave teams no time to react. And yet Mercedes seemed to be able to react. And Red Bull team boss Christian Horner described the second floor stay as something overtly biased towards Mercedes specific problems. And somehow Mercedes is the only team that managed to turn up with a second floor stay on the car in Friday practice. They weren't the only team to hint at this. Ferrari did, Alpine did as well. And it's almost been openly suggested that Mercedes either knew it was coming or had been able to preempt it in some way. Um, Mercedes' position was that they just reacted on site um, as best they could. Other teams said that that's not possible, but they'll just take it at face value. Um, In the end, Mercedes didn't even run the second floor, so they took it off after FP2 because it didn't really work. So... There's all sorts going on here. There's uh, Toto Wolf got very, very animated in a meeting between team bosses on Saturday morning. Horner said that that was just him playing up to the cameras because Netflix were there filming it for for the next season of Drive to Survive. There's honestly so much to this. It's so layered. I've probably done a terrible job of summarising it there and in a pretty uh, war- warbling way. But there will be a video on the race's YouTube channel Um probably will be up a few hours after people are listening to this podcast keep an eye out for that on on monday i hope i have done a much better job of explaining that concisely but thoroughly uh, so that will be on the youtube channel at some point on monday no, i think you've explained it very well on on this podcast but it's a really difficult one isn't it mark because 
I think we can all get on board with the principle that we don't want drivers being battered and having potentially lifelong injuries from this, damage to the spine, all sorts of concerns about that. But at the same time, you can see why the teams that aren't suffering from that would object to rule changes. You can see why this metric limiting the vertical oscillations is potentially a nice, elegant solution, but there's also problems with it as well. And even James Allison at Mercedes has said that it's potentially problematic. So what's the outcome of this? Who's who's on the side of the righteous when it comes to this debate? Or is there no such thing in F1? No, there isn't. You, 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 you bang on, there isn't such a thing. Um, the, the principle... Is is really is really quite good because the difficulty that the FIA was facing as a governing body was it it was required to take action once the drivers were all almost almost united in saying this is unacceptable, regardless of the competitive position of which their teams. The, the drivers independently were saying we're seriously concerned that we don't know what damage we are doing. To our to our bodies, um, not just muscle damage, but possible brain damage and all of it long term. So, with that not understood, it would be remiss of the governing body to just say, "Just you'll have to lump it, and we'll try and do something for next year." That 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 wouldn't have been a responsible attitude to take. But at the same time, there was a feeling that Mercedes were campaigning for this for competitive reasons. So it couldn't be seen to be favouring Mercedes. And they actually did come up with a way of addressing the driver's concerns while doing something which ostensibly made it even more difficult for Mercedes to be competitive. Because they were saying, instead of a universal high right height, which would have made, in theory, Mercedes more competitive, we're not going to do that. We're going to say a universal low impact rate and you'll have to use whatever ride height will facilitate that. So in theory, that would hurt Mercedes and make them further away than ever. So it got rid of that, um, uh, the, 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 the perception that the change was just as a result of caving into Mercedes pressure, because actually it wouldn't have done that. But it, it taken to sort of the collateral damage would probably have been Ferrari, because relative to Red Bull, did they do they do have a serious porpoising issue than, than Red Bull. So I, I would imagine that whatever limit was set, Red Bull would pass it easily with, with their car as it is at the moment, would, would, would probably not have to change the car. Um, and it's probably um, not true of Ferrari. So it, in principle, I think it was a good solution, but um, it's, it's in the implementation of it and how horribly complicated it would have been to have imposed it um, at such short notice, and to do it in a transparent way so that uh, everyone can see everybody else's data and there wouldn't be any argument. We're hoping that they will actually find a way to implement that fairly and properly for, for Silverstone because it is a good way of doing it. And I, I do think you're right, Mark, to zero in on the fact that this solution doesn't compromise those who don't have a problem with it and it shouldn't because the fact that some are having problems others aren't and Mercedes are at the most extreme end of the problems shows that it's not absolutely locked into to what the regulations are so it's only right that they take this sort of approach even if Mercedes don't necessarily like it but I think we're going to hear a lot about this at Silverstone aren't we because it, it, the devil's in the detail when it comes to these particular things and when you're talking about vertical oscillations exactly how you're measuring them for how long you know what what kind of spikes you can have exactly how you you frame it and make sure everybody's happy with it is is the big challenge well more on montreal in a moment but first time for an update on grid rival grid rivals the fancy motorsport game the race has its own league in which features a fierce battle between scott and myself how did you do this week scott very very well uh came painfully close to breaking the thousand point barrier uh, which would have been the first time I, I achieved that, I think, this season. So, uh, yeah, very, very, very close. Let down in the end by, I think, um, I'll, I'll put it down to Fernando Alonso's engine problem that um, he says stopped him fighting for a podium finish. Had that come off, I'd have been comfortably in the, uh, you know, 1,000-plus bracket. Well, 
you may think you've done pretty well, but I've got 1,083 points this time. I had Verstappen, Sainz, Alonso, Bottas and Joe and Alpine. So everything in the top nine. So I, I was quite happy with that. Uh, I have to say Alonso is my double points talent driver. I was reasonably happy with him, even though it could have been better. Not bad at all. So I've dramatically improved since last week's slightly missing the deadline when I only had two drivers out. So uh, I, I'm pretty pleased. I think 1,083 is my uh, is my highest score. So... I'm feeling quite good about myself until, of course, it comes to the moment where we hail the overall league leader, which for the second week in a row is Nath Hard Six, who leads everybody in our league. Just the 902 points this week, though, for uh, for Nath Hard. Pathetic. The lineup of Alonso. Absolutely pathetic. Well, had a bit of bad luck with retirements. Had Alonso, Perez, Hamilton, Russell, Schumacher and Red Bull. So Perez and Schumacher letting the side down there. So the comeback's on. That's what we're saying. Well, I think we've both caught the overall leader. So by our standards, that's that's mildly miraculous. So we're doing well. I think we've we've let the tyres bed in early in the stint and we're ready to really push on through the middle stages of the season. And if you want to join us, Grid Rival is still open for sign-ups and we'll be tracking progress through the year. So download the Grid Rival app or visit the website so you can get involved. The link's in the episode description for this podcast. Let's get back to Montreal now, Mark. Fernando Alonso was massively in the headlines all weekend, really. He was fast throughout on the front row for the first time in a decade, ran second early on, then finished seventh on the road behind Esteban Ocon, then, of course, got a five-second penalty for weaving while defending against Valtteri Bottas. So what went wrong for his race? Uh, his power unit problem, mainly, uh, which was restricting him on the straights and also the timing of the safety car. So he was just into the chicane, as they threw the safety car, um, which allowed Ocon to get in, ironically, and, and Alonso to have to do it the following lap, um, and that put him behind his teammate. So, um, yeah, just a combination of things, really, but um, fantastically impressive in qualifying to stick it on the front row. And, um, yeah, beautiful lap. We did a piece about it on the website, and, um, yeah, it, it promised much, but sort of... Um, petered out a little bit on race day, not through any fault of his. Yeah, it shows Fernando Alonso, if there are any doubt, can still do it. The the weaving penalty, I'm not particularly surprised by. That was on the last lap coming down towards the uh, the last chicane. He started weaving really early in the straight and Bottas kind of went one way then the other. At one stage, Bottas even had to lift as Alonso moved back across to the left. So I have to say, when I saw that, I felt Alonso was was bang to right. So yeah, again, he's uh, he's lost out a little bit to to a post race penalty, but encouraging for Alpine that they were able to uh, to run well and at least solid points for them. Scott, let's move on to Alfa Romeo. That team put its recent struggles behind it with Valtteri Bottas seventh and Joe Guanyu eighth. Thomas Knight asks, was this Joe's most complete weekend so far? Good in quality and tricky conditions, and got unlucky with a safety car. Yeah, I thought he um I thought he did a really good job. Um he looked confident in uh in, in all of qualifying and and he always looked actually like he was nailed on to get through to Q3. He was um he was super confident and comfortable in the conditions. Um so was understandably delighted with uh with making Q3 and and rightly so. He did did a very good job and then he was converting that into an excellent drive. Um, on in, in the race, um, comfortably inside the points. When um, it did briefly look like his race might be going away from him in the sort of uh, middle phase, when he was getting clearly frustrated being stuck behind Lance Stroll's uh, in the widest Aston Martin ever. Um, and then there was a little bit of complaining over the radio, then a lock up into the hairpin. And it just felt a bit like Joe just needed to calm down a little bit, just make sure he kept his composure because he can only play the race that's in front of him at that point. And it was still very much going towards the top 10 finish. So I can understand why he was starting to panic a little bit. He probably thought that this was the the race unraveling, but that wasn't the case. So he, to his credit, he, he he stuck gamely to his task. He he was all over Stroll, and then obviously, eventually, the Aston Martin came into the pits. Um, and yeah, just uh, after that, uh, the the Alpha looked comfortably quick enough in the midfield to, to to be in the top ten. But it's one thing to have that car with that potential, and another to 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 manage the race from start to finish and actually deliver on it. And fair play to Joe. I think this was uh, 
this was a weekend in which he absolutely showed the credentials to be a good uh, a good Grand Prix driver. Um, he's actually been impressive this season, I think, from pretty much the, the beginning. He's got the right attitude. He needed to pick up in qualifying. He did that here um, and showed that the, the promise he, he has in, in terms of race pace, if he qualifies a little bit better, he can be doing this more often. So the challenge now is to try and replicate this in dry conditions, in in more conventional circumstances. But this was an absolutely excellent weekend, no doubt. Yeah, and I think he deserved a result because he's had a little bit of misfortune. He'd, he'd have had other points finishes if he'd not had reliability problems. Obviously, he got that point in Bahrain, but nothing since. Actually, I had a chat to him at the start of the weekend for a piece uh, planning to put together. I had to do it over Zoom because I couldn't be there in person. I was going to obviously do it so, in Canada uh, originally, but he, he's just had a low-key good season. I'm pleased he had this halo result, if you like, to, to show people what he's doing. It's his approach that impresses me. He's generally pretty level-headed and sensible in races, hasn't made big mistakes, and he's just sort of chipping away, working away at it, and generally just doing a, a very a very nice, tidy job. Mark, Aston Martin, they had genuinely strong pace this weekend, so why did it come away with just that one point for Lance Stroll's 10th place? Hey, a few things. They, the pace that they showed in the dry on Friday was a little bit misleading. They used an extra set of tyres to do that and benefit from the track being quicker so they weren't quite as quick as they looked but they were yeah they were certainly in that um in the midfield the, the upper midfield mix and should have probably been uh q3 um, graduates but um yeah they, they they got the the judge the tire pressures um badly wrong in qualifying in q1 so the track was ramping up very very quickly and in those conditions um a high tire pressure will get the tire quickly up to temperature, but if um, it, if the track is increasing in grip uh, too suddenly, it just means that it goes over pressure. That the, the, the pressure is too high and there's not enough uh, contact patch on the track, and uh, that's what happened. So they they, they needed to have um, reduced the, the tire pressures more than they did, and so they just had nothing. You'll have heard Seb's sort of absolutely. Incom- you know, uncomprehending uh, afterwards. What, 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 what on earth was that? What happened there? You know, this is the car that I was I was driving earlier this morning, and it was just that. It was just tire pressures. So that put them out in Q one, and it, it, you know, the, the car that should have been in Q three, and then Seb's race went wrong. Every he was just every decision they made turned out to be uh, wrong because of what subsequently happened with VSCs and things. So he came in very early to try and get some free air um and then the vsc came out and you know that that meant that negated the advantage of that um and uh, he was another that didn't wasn't able to uh pit because of the timing um of the safety car and yeah in the end he had uh, so little tie grip left that uh he was moved aside and lance for lance to to come through and uh, yeah, Lance drove well, as he quite often does around here, around his home track, um, to get a points finish. Yeah, Lance Stroll's been struggling a little bit in confidence in that car since it's been upgraded, just trying to adapt to it. We've seen that a few times in the past when there have been major upgrades. It's taken him a few races to get dialed into it, so maybe this is a bit of a, uh, a launching pad for him. Moving on to Haas, Scott, can I ask if teams are eligible for Sympathy Corner? Do we need Haas Sympathy Corner after a third row lockout yielded nothing more than a 17th place for Kevin Magnussen? Uh, no, I'm going to rule that uh, a team can't be eligible for Sympathy Corner for the circumstances that Haas found itself in today because I believe that Kevin Magnussen was ultimately the architect of his own downfall. But we, I think it's absolutely ripe for a Mick Schumacher sympathy corner. What do you say? I think that's fair, and I think it's best summed up by what Mick Schumacher tweeted not so long ago, which was just the word gutted. I thought it was better the way he described it in the in a quote that has a, even managed to make it into the official Haas press release, where Mick Schumacher basically described his weekend as... I, he said building. I assume he means like baking or making. But he said building a cake but not being able to put the frosting on or something like that. Which obviously, you know, a cake with no frosting on is what's it's basically a punch in the face, isn't it? It's an absolute waste of time. So, Mick, that sort of summed up quite nicely how Mick felt. He obviously career best qualifying. Um, he he looked really at home in 
in in in the wet conditions there's there's something about a Schumacher qualifying in the uh, in in very very tricky conditions is isn't there it's clearly in the genes um and Mick did a great job uh, he was very very happy he said he felt it proved his credentials basically as an F1 driver he's obviously under a lot of scrutiny at the moment i thought that was a slightly premature declaration just purely because obviously like you've still got the race to do <laughs> it's just a bold thing to say um, after qualifying but we know we know he's good and it, it was nice to have that uh, yet another flash of potential there and he was doing a decent job early on he he definitely looked like he was on course uh, he was tracking towards a, a top 10 finish he was running ahead of joe at the time wasn't he um and obviously joe scored scored points so it's just absolutely gutting for him and the, and and the team that uh, he had what I, I presume is yet another Ferrari related power unit failure. Um, he, if he keeps putting in performances like this, like he will break his points duck eventually. Um, he just has to he just has to keep going along. I have a sadly the way it's going for Haas at the moment I do feel like we might visit Mick Schumacher sympathy corner once or twice again before the season is out but I would like to think he will have more points finishes by the end of the year than he will have appearances on this this segment of the podcast where we go into sympathy corner yeah he's now racked up 30 F1 race starts without a point which is a bit unfortunate you can't really uh, blame him for for last season but yeah this season you'd have you'd have counted on him getting on the board by now where does he where does he rank in terms of race starts without a point, do you have that information to hand, Ed Straw? Oh, well, Luca Badal is top with 50 race starts without a point. So Mick Schumacher could go on for a good while yet without uh, without overhauling that one. But he's, he's, getting, he's getting up there. Part of me almost wants it to keep going because I quite like that record, but I, I don't think Mick Schumacher would really deserve it. But then again, I don't really think Luca Badal deserves uh, such a cruel record as he was... Uh, a, a, a properly decent driver, despite what that record might suggest. Uh, let's move on to McLaren, Mark. An anonymous weekend for them. Danny Ricciardo was 11, Landon Norris 15th. He had a five-second penalty for speeding in the pits for good measure. Was this a question of bad luck for McLaren or just bad performance? Um, bad performance and bad luck. They, they, it's not a car that is suited to this track. It's a bit draggy, so they trimmed it out, but then it's it's out of its happy place in terms of the efficiency so not very aero efficient um in addition lando because of that uh sensor problem which they couldn't trace in time uh on uh, saturday they changed his power unit for a an old one which is at the end of its mileage and they reckoned about three tenths down on that and you know everything just one thing on top of another then there was a he was stacked in the pits and daniel had a problem so that <laughs> meant that he um, it snowballed into Lando's problem and then was he's tired the correct set of tires weren't ready so it was just a shambles of a weekend really but it, it, it wasn't like it was a shambles of a weekend and a, a decent car performance underneath it just it, there wasn't very much there to uh, write home about around this track well if you're going to have a, a shambolic weekend you might as well make it one when you're not that quick certainly this track and Baku weren't great for the McLaren were they it's not the Strongest car in in the straight. I think they leaned it out a little bit here to get straight line speed, but then they were giving away performance in the corners. So yeah, these probably were two weekends to be endured rather than enjoyed for McLaren. So let's see how they get on when we get to perhaps more normal climbs at, at Silverstone because that car has been pretty quick at times this season. Scott, we have to mention poor old Yuki Tsunoda. He started at the back thanks to power unit penalties. Wasn't on course for points, which wasn't a great surprise when he slid into the wall exiting the pits that's not what we've come to expect from him in 2022 is it it's had a pretty decent season so far yeah exactly I said uh during the race that this felt like the sort of error that um in between the 2021 Bahrain and Abu Dhabi Grand Prix with both of those were very good synod performances in his rookie season this felt like the sort of thing that could have happened in any one of those intervening races it's definitely not the sort of thing um, I would associate the 2022 version of Sonoda with with doing. Um, but he, it, I got the impression in the because uh, obviously we, we're now starting to get snippets of the cool down room again after after the race, and I got the impression from Signs and Verstappen when they reacted to the replay of Sonoda having that accident in the background while they were in the cool down room that actually they had a bit of sympathy with him because Verstappen would seem to be suggesting that there was just no grip out there or very, very low grip out there anyway. And Sainz, I think, said that there's like a bump or something that he'd been worried about all weekend. 
uh, coming out of the, the that pit lane. And it is obviously very difficult because you rejoin massively offline into what is turn two. So, you know, ultimately, the two top guys in the Canadian Grand Prix seem to have a little bit of sympathy for Sonoda. Maybe we shouldn't judge him too harshly, harshly but it was a... Uh, it was a very unfortunate error, wasn't it? It went when when I saw the car broken, I thought, "Oh, please tell me he's not dropped it coming out the pit lane exit." And yet, unfortunately, the replay confirmed exactly that. Yeah, it's one of those things that is horrible when it happens. You understand how it how it comes to pass, and he's not the first driver. I remember Esteban Gutierrez doing that for Sauber uh, some years ago, so it can happen. But yeah, just uh, ultimately, just goes down as a, as a horrible mistake, and it been quite painful for for Sonoda, but hopefully, just a blip in. What's otherwise been a pretty good season? Uh, we're going to finish off with some quick-fire listener questions. So, Scott, we'll start off with Lando Norris. A question from Chris Parrott, who asks, would there be any performance clauses in Lando's contract with McLaren? I can't help but wonder if he's questioning his long-term deal with the team, given the regression experienced in 2022. Yeah, there must be. There, 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 there must be some elements to it. I seem to remember, I can't, I, I can't recall exactly, but I seem to remember when the new deal was done at the start of the year, McLaren were absolutely adamant McLaren and Norris were absolutely adamant there was nothing and it was a straight con- contract through to 2025 but that would just seem that would just seem so so risky from his point of view you know his his stock is constantly rising he's one of the one of the most exciting drivers in in Formula 1 he's probably the best or most in demand driver you would imagine outside of the top 3 teams so why why lock yourself down to a team that obviously you've got a lot of confidence in but ultimately has yet to really deliver on that confidence we've seen this year how far off McLaren is actually being able to do what Ferrari has done for example that is still a few years away yet um and the Norris will only be will still have two years to run of his current deal by the time we really see McLaren make inroads in the top teams we're expecting that 2024 car to be the first time their big infrastructure projects pay off with the new wind tunnel and simulator so i'd be surprised if there isn't a get out clause of some kind but obviously it would be very very good if he would never has to go down that route because if norris can lead mclaren to be back back to being a regular race winner again that would obviously be a very cool story given that he's he's been with that team for so long yeah and i think this year is always going to be a transitional year for mclaren they're still beefing up all the infrastructure, et cetera, wind tunnel, that kind of thing, still coming through. So while it's not been a great season for them, I don't think we could have really have expected them to be uh, to be battling at the front this year. Mark, Simon T asks if James Allison being at the track this weekend was significant or just a planned trip. Does him being there put pressure on Mike Elliott or would they be working closely behind the scenes anyway? Oh, I think since um, the, the extent of the problems with this car have become apparent, they've been um, all hands all hands the to, to to the pumps and uh yeah he's uh probably just seeing um seeing how he can uh help in the field but yeah if you've got some amount of sympathy for mike elliott he's um you know the first car that he's been in full charge of is is turned is turned out to be not a good one and so you, you'd, you'd only be human if he was feeling um some pressure but i i don't i don't think that that's um it's such a, um, a a group effort these days. Hundreds of people. Uh, I think um, he's, he's, he's. I don't think he's in any imminent danger there. But uh, yeah, having having someone of the caliber of James Allison there is um, is is never going to be a bad thing, is it? Scott, one more from Simon T, who asks if Mercedes still believe in this concept, or are the wheels already turning to right the wrongs in next year's car with a different philosophy? So I think this is a bit similar to what we talked about before in that I don't think you can right the wrongs of this year's car by just coming up with something completely different from nowhere. But what Mercedes keeps saying is that to improve for 2023, you need to understand exactly what you've got wrong for 2022. And I know that there's a limit to what you can do in season if the fundamental concept is the problem. And if Mercedes has understood that, then obviously this this will change. But they'd be improving the 2022 car faster or have more confidence in improving the 2022 car if they'd really got on top of everything. Obviously, I think they've identified the main limitations. They've, they've got on top of the porpoising, but they know that they've got a fundamentally stiff car concept. Um, clearly, there's something in the uh, 
in the suspension, uh, whether it's limited geometry or whatever, that, that just doesn't quite work with, with this generation of car. Maybe that's the sort of thing that can't change in season and therefore relies on a 2023 concept change or design change in, in, in a key area. Ultimately, with where we are now in the championship and the fact that Mercedes aren't winning races and it's, they're still so far behind... Anything they do for this year is really with an eye on 2023 anyway. They're not going to save a title bid this season now. that they're, they're, they're out of it. They're clinging on in the most sort of generous of, of, of fashions. So, yeah, it is kind of all on 2023 in a way, but not, not in so far as, you know, deciding that the 2022 cars are complete lost cause and therefore they're starting from a, a blank sheet of paper. I, I don't think they're in a position... To, to do that obviously I, I I could be wrong but it would it, w- it would just seem illogical for them to be able to just go right let's start designing a brand new car from scratch and then actually know where to begin with that if given the 2022 cars not working well at all they've, they've they've got this one wrong so why would they have any confidence in starting a new concept from scratch and getting that one right yeah, there's always things you can learn and although it does seem the next year's car will perhaps be built around some slightly different assumptions in terms of the mechanical platform and where they want to run it. There's still work they have to do uh, to do with this one. Mark, Chris Parrott, simple question here. What's the current true pecking order between McLaren, Alpine, Alfa Romeo, Aston Martin and Alfa Tauri? should throw Hass in there as well. Yeah, I think um, the only thing you could say for sure about that was um, Alpine's established itself at the head of it, I think. Um, but at the others, it... it changes from track to track the, the 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 lap time difference between them all is so small that just a, you know a little bit of cloud cover could completely change the order between them so i think on merit there there's alpine and then the rest of them and they're much of a muchness um there are variations on how well they are operated but in terms of speed of the car itself yeah i would say it's alpine and then the rest of them much of a muchness and a final question for you, Scott, from Philip Esposito, who says, I heard that Jacques Villeneuve said Sainz bottled it in qualifying. Then after the safety car, Sainz had a couple of laps when he closed up within half a second after sector two, but consistently lost time at the hairpin to ruin any chance to attack. Is the criticism justified or were Verstappen and Red Bull simply on another level? I think Verstappen was imperious this weekend. I don't think Sainz bottled it in terms of getting pole, but he, he obviously should have been um, ahead of Fernando Alonso. He had a ridiculous uh, throw it in and see what happens attitude to the final corner in qualifying that cost him a whole heap of time had he not done that he'd about qualified Alonso so he bottled a front row start but he, he, I don't think he'd have beaten Verstappen Verstappen's lap was great and he, he, he just looked really comfortable and then yeah in the race the thing is the it almost looks like through the medium speed corners following in this car's not not terrible um but the slow speed stuff's clearly very difficult when you're just trying to get everything out of it under braking it's moving around loads you're really putting an emphasis on on the grip to get the get the car rotated it it just looks like everyone was sort of losing a tenth two tenths through the hairpin when they followed um other cars so i don't really think you can blame signs uh, for for not getting past Verstappen, I I was I had a feeling he needed to come off the hairpin five or six temps behind um, to really have a chance down into the final corner, or even then you know force Verstappen to defend and then try and get him on the run down towards turn one afterwards. Um, but even though he went into the hairpin sort of six temps behind a couple of times, he, as soon as he did that, he just couldn't get the front in. You could see that he was really struggling. And then in the final two laps, you saw that manifest itself even more extremely. So, yeah, I, I just don't think there was anything really Science was going to do there to, to, to win the race uh, without a Verstappen error, which never looked like it was going to come. And as we've seen all year, it is very, very difficult to pass a Red Bull in a Ferrari. The other way around, different story. But yeah, I don't think we can complain too much about Science. So I do think qualifying, last corners in qualifying laps have been a little bit of his enemy this year at, at, at times in terms of trying to balance up how much to attack and how much to consolidate. But uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that's a relatively minor criticism. Well, thanks very much, Mark Hughes and Scott Mitchell, for your insight. Head to the race.com and don't forget the hyphen. It says loads to read there, including Mark's race analysis, my driver ratings, and Scott's various 
delves into technical directive arguments and Mick Schumacher's disappointment, etc., that he's got planned. Check out our YouTube channel to search for the race and also try out some of our sister podcasts, including the Race IndyCar podcast and Bring Back V10s, which tells classic F1 stories. We've got a two-week gap now, but stay with us for everything you need to know for the world of Formula One. <laughs>